Today we have um, Dr. Nicholas Schmuel, who's here to talk, uh, speak with us. He's an assistant scientist here in the Department of OBGYN in reproductive and population health. He did his undergraduate and graduate work here at UW-Madison, um, including a PhD in mass communication. He is involved in research in health communications and health attitudes uh, with a focus on population health and community level engagement. So please join me in virtually welcoming Dr. Schmuel this morning. <clears throat> Thank you. Introduction. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, an honor to be here presenting this morning. And of course, I wish we could all see each other in person, but uh, since we can't, I'm glad to be here virtually. I have no disclosures. So these are the learning objectives for my talk. I won't read through them word for word, but I do hope everyone leaves today with some ideas about how concepts like health attitudes and knowledge and beliefs and uh, can intersect with their own work. And my personal objective here is to plant the seeds of collaboration with all of you. So when I ran rounds every week, I'm often reminded of how related the concepts of health attitudes and, and knowledge and beliefs are to the great work that you're all doing in the department. So if any of you are interested in further about how those things play a role in your work, please get in touch. I would be very excited to explore those things with you. So we live in a time when everyone's attitudes are very much on display on the internet. Everyone's an expert, but even if they're not, they can still put their attitudes out there for everyone to see. And this phenomenon definitely includes a whole range of health issues. A number of those health issues that have become part of the public conversation are very relevant to women's health, for better or worse. And these include vaccines, abortion rights, whether to mandate contraceptive coverage as part of health insurance, and of course, attitudes about COVID-19 among political leaders and members of the public are currently impacting almost every aspect of our lives. Today, I wanna to start with a 30,000 foot view of how attitudes and their components have been studied in academia, especially in the context of health. And I'll briefly discuss some theoretical models that use attitudes to predict health behaviors and then I'll move on to focus on some work that's happening here in this department that very much incorporates the concepts of health attitudes, beliefs, and knowledge. So there's never really been a time when there was a direct line between information and behavior. So this cartoon is a bit of a false narrative, but even back in the era of the three major broadcast networks, Joseph Clapper, who was a media scholar, famously wrote, by and large, people tend to expose themselves to mass communications which are in accord with their existing attitudes. A bit further back, Milwaukee's very own Floyd Alport called attitudes probably the most distinctive and indispensable concept in social psychology. And more recently, Alice Eagley and Shelley Chaikin uh, took a stab at defining attitudes, and they wrote that an attitude is psychological tendency that is expressed by evaluating a particular entity with some degree of favor or disfavor. And so that definition is admittedly a bit clunky and uh, can break it down into its parts and it's fairly straightforward. So if an attitude is a tendency to evaluate an entity favorably or unfavorably, we can define the entity as uh, the person, place, thing, or idea that is the object of the attitude. It can be something abstract, like I want my kid to be healthy. It can be a little more uh, concrete, like my child should get the recommended vaccines. And uh, we can have attitudes about things that are individual or specific, like I trust my doctor, or uh, those things can be more collective, like I trust doctors in general. So the evaluation piece is simply a favorable or unfavorable evaluation of something, um, <clears throat> but it's important to note that attitudes can be ambivalent. Uh, we can have favorable and unfavorable thoughts about something at the same time, and uh, we can modify attitudes by activating those favorable or unfavorable thoughts through messaging or other kinds of interventions. 
<clears throat> I think this concept of tendency is also really important. People don't often make snap judgments about uh, issues that are important. Rather, uh, attitudes often result from a long history of personal experiences, uh, others' experiences that uh, they tell us about, uh, what we think others around us are doing and thinking. And of course, we get a steady diet of uh, media, media messages and other kinds of messaging that all build up over our lifetimes and affect our tendencies to see the world uh, through particular lenses. So a few years after that original definition of attitudes, uh, Evely and Chagan took this second stab and came up with a more streamlined model, the ABC model, which uh, posits that attitudes are comprised of affect, behavioral intentions, and cognitions, which is an umbrella term for knowledge and beliefs. So what are knowledge and beliefs? These are fairly similar and overlapping concepts, but I think knowledge implies evidence, facts, and truth, whereas belief implies a different kind of system of understanding the world, something like religion or culture, morals and ethics, or politics. But of course, science is a belief system. In this medical sphere, it happens to be the predominant system of understanding the world, certainly not the only type of belief that comes into play when making health decisions. At the end of the day, it doesn't really have to be rocket science. Uh, there are entire graduate school, school courses and textbooks that revolve around these ideas. But we don't have to go too far down the rabbit hole. I think we all have a common understanding of what the words attitude and belief and knowledge mean, and those meanings should su suffice for the rest of this talk this morning. So why should we care about studying attitudes and their components? Well, I would propose that we can uh, understand and predict health behavior if we understand the underlying attitudes. And when we have that baseline understanding, we can use it to guide interventions. And of course, we do that alongside other kinds of interventions that target the social and environmental factors that very much play into the puzzle that is health behavior. I also want to remind everyone that healthcare providers have attitudes too. They aren't just walking encyclopedias of the results of clinical trials. Uh, they have other types of beliefs that play into what they do and think. We often think about patients and the public being the ones that have the attitudes that impact health outcomes, but healthcare provider attitudes certainly play a role. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. There are a number of theories that involve attitudes and try to use attitudes to understand or predict behavior. This is not an exhaustive list. And today I'm going to just touch on these first two, the health belief model and the theory of planned behavior. And these just happen to be the models that I tend to return to uh, when I'm trying to understand some health behavior. Uh, but as I said earlier, uh, if another model would be more useful for understanding the work that you do, I'd be happy to talk about any of these with any of you. So uh, the health belief model was originally developed in the 50s by uh, some scientists that were working for the Public Health Service. It includes background factors like demographics and psychological characteristics, uh, health motivation, and also perceptions about susceptibility severity, uh, the benefits of uh, health behavior, and uh, barriers to a given health behavior. So this is how the model maps out. You can see that those background characteristics lead to different kinds of beliefs and attitudes, and those end up affecting action. And there's also a box there that says cues to action. Those are some outside influences like media messages or even healthcare provider recommendations for a particular behavior uh, that also impact actions. And this model has been used to study a long list of different health behaviors. And those include screenings for cancer and other types of conditions immunization, accident prevention, and medication adherence. Now, moving on to the theory of planned behavior, uh, these 
components are really quite similar to what's involved in the health belief model. The terminology is just a little bit different. So this model uh, involves one's own attitudes about a particular behavior, subjective norms, which is this belief that we all have about what people around us are doing and thinking and what they think that we should do. Uh, it involves perceived behavioral control, which is sometimes referred to as self-efficacy. That is the idea that uh, I have within me the power to accomplish some health behavior that I intend to do. And uh, significantly, this model only purports to predict behavioral intentions rather than behaviors themselves. And that is an acknowledgement that there are outside factors, social and environmental factors, that really do uh, get in the way of our ability to accomplish certain things, even if we very much intend to do them. So this is how the model play, uh, maps out. Uh, you can see that attitudes and subjective norms and perceived behavioral control are all interrelated and they affect intentions, which in turn affects behavior. And again, you can see that dotted line from perceived behavioral control to behavior. And that is, again, acknowledging the idea that, uh, you know, I might very much intend and want to take my child into a clinic to get a vaccine. But, you know, if I believe that it's going to be a problem that I don't have transportation or that I can't leave my job uh, in order to get to the clinic on time, those things are probably true, and those things are really going to impact my ability to perform that behavior, even if I intend to do so. So this model has also been used to predict uh, and understand a whole list of health behaviors and also non-health behaviors. Some of those uh, include alcohol use, weight loss, limiting infant's sugar intake, exercising after giving birth, condom use, so on and so forth. Now I just want to give you a quick glimpse of these theories in action. This is a study that compares both models and their ability to predict HPV vaccine uptake, which is an outcome that many of us in this department are interested in. And the context here is that these researchers wanted to test a couple of different kinds of messaging, uh, loss-based messaging and gain-based messaging, uh, to see which was more effective in predicting uptake of the HPV vaccine among young adult women. And uh, what turned out is that neither of those types of messaging were actually effective in predicting uptake of the HPV vaccine. But uh, they also administered some questionnaires to measure the participant characteristics that uh, are related to these components of both the health belief model and the theory of planned behavior. And they put together this combined model to show how everything works together and ends up uh, impacting HPV vaccine uptake. So you'll see all the different components here, and some of them are, are very much overlapping with one another. Again, the uh, loss messages and gain messages don't have any significant impact ultimately on HPV vaccine uptake. But the things that do have uh, an impact in the long run are again, subjective norms and self-efficacy. And I think it's important to note that uh, what predicts uh, the types of subjective norms and feelings of self-efficacy that lead to HPV vaccine uptake is a physician recommendation for the HPV vaccine. And that's exactly why those of us who try to promote HPV vaccine uptake continue to hammer away at this idea that what we really need are strong, full-throated, recommendations from healthcare providers uh, to parents about the HPV vaccine. Time and time again, every study seems to show that this is the one consistent thing that we can do to make sure that people walk out of the clinic vaccinated against HPV. Okay, so now I wanna quickly go through a few examples of work that and going on in this department that heavily incorporates the concepts of attitudes and health beliefs. First, I want to go back to this quality improvement initiative from a few years ago called Our Kids Need the HPV Vaccine. This was a, an educational intervention at 
UW Health Family Medicine and Pediatrics Clinics. And it was meant to target various components of healthcare provider attitudes about the HPV vaccine. So we tried to make an impact on uh, providers' thoughts about susceptibility to the HPV vaccine by uh, showing that it is definitely prevalent in our society. We tried to uh, send a message that HPV has some very serious consequences, including cancer. We tried to act on some uh, damaging subjective feelings uh, among the physician population at that time that uh, parents had a particular skepticism or would push back a lot more regarding this particular vaccine as compared to other adolescent vaccines. But a lot of other research out there really showed that what those parents were waiting for was a confident recommendation from their healthcare provider and that they really didn't have uh, different attitudes about this vaccine versus the other vaccines that were recommended at the same time for their adolescents. And finally, we tried to make an impact on people's feelings of self-efficacy by offering strategies for communicating with parents and patients about HPV vaccination. <clears throat> so I, I don't want to go too deep into the results, but we did observe higher initiation and completion rates among 11 to 18-year-olds at the clinics that received the, interve uh, the intervention versus uh, non-intervention clinics. We also found that this effect continued to reverberate after three years. And the reason that I, I show you this graph at all, which indicates uh, vaccination rates among 13 to 18 year olds, is that uh, throughout the time that we were undertaking this intervention, there were some environmental factors and uh, also attitudes were just changing about HPV among the population. So uh, vaccine had been out for a few years at this time. So slowly but surely, people were becoming accustomed to it. Both healthcare providers and patients were uh, not surprised to see this among the list of recommended vaccines. So slowly, uh, vaccination rates uh, for HPV were rising everywhere. And what you can see here from the darker red and the darker blue lines is that at the clinics where we instituted this intervention, we were able to uh, make that change move a little bit faster. So another way to promote the HPV vaccine is by making sure that healthcare providers are aware of the real science behind the vaccine amid a lot of junk science and bogus claims that are out there about HPV vaccine. And perhaps some of you saw about two years ago, this peer reviewed paper uh, published in a seemingly legitimate academic journal that took NHANES survey data and some birth rate data and used what I would say are some fairly lazy analyses and logical leaps to imply that uh, the HPV vaccine was causing primary ovarian insufficiency among young women. And uh, this analysis didn't make sense for a whole host of reasons. And the author of that article notably uh, had made a career out of slandering various vaccines. So our team uh, take, took a look at the NHANES data and saw a number of ways to improve that analysis. And we crunched the numbers and found no association between PV vaccination and infertility. So uh, it helps that the original paper was retracted but our reason for doing this is that we hope that healthcare providers will see our paper and that will uh, allay any concerns that they might have about connections between the vaccine and infertility and allow them to be more confident in recommending the vaccine for their patients. So now I wanna move on to our recent survey of abortion attitudes among UW SMPH clinical faculty. This study was really all about attitudes and their impacts. And uh, the survey included questions about various attitude components and behavioral intentions and behaviors regarding abortion. And as a result, we were able to put together a couple of models to predict outcomes of interest, including overall support for abortion and willingness to consult in abortion cases among the physician population here at UW. 
These survey results uh, have been presented previously here at Grand Rounds. So I just want to recap a couple of key factors that play into our prediction models. For example, we combined measures of support for abortion access and abortion providers into an overall measure of support. And we found that upwards of 80% say that they support abortion at least somewhat. So maybe due to the fact that support was really quite high across all segments of the faculty, we didn't find many underlying factors that significantly predicted support for abortion. Uh, as you can see, uh, we found that gender and religiosity were important predictors. Those who identified as female are about twice as likely to say that they support abortion, while those who say that they're highly religious are quite a bit less likely to say that they support abortion. And of course, gender and religiosity aren't attitudes or beliefs, but uh, they are factors that underlie attitudes and knowing that is helpful. So at the very least, we can communicate more effectively with certain segments of the physician population about the importance of abortion access and why it's important to their patients. In the realm of behavioral intentions, we ultimately wanted to know how willing the physician population was to participate in abortion care in whatever way was in their wheelhouse. So we asked several different ways how willing they were to consult in abortion cases and found that about 60% were willing to do so. When it comes to behavioral, you'll recall that subjective norms are often a significant predictor. And so we constructed this variable that compared physicians' own support for abortion to their perceptions of support among their peers. And uh, we found that about 60% of the physician population at UW actually believes that their peers are relatively less supportive of abortion. Taking a look at our model predicting willingness to consult in abortion cases, we found a number of significant underlying factors. Once again, we found that gender and religiosity are important. Uh, exposure to abortion during medical training was a significant predictor in that those people were slightly more likely to say that they were willing to consult in abortion care. Uh, similarly, uh, feelings that one's expertise was relevant to the topic of abortion led to higher willingness to consult in the care of patients seeking abortion. And the result that I find particularly interesting is uh, this subjective norms result that those who believe that their peers are relatively less supportive of abortion are also less likely to be willing to consult in the care of patients seeking an abortion. So that's this concept of subjective norms in action. And we can actually counteract that belief just by conducting this study and uh, reporting the results, which again show that physicians across all specialties and socio demographics here at UW are fairly overwhelmingly supportive of abortion. To be thorough, at the end of our long 45 question survey, we gave people this final opportunity to say whatever else they wanted us to know about their attitudes and beliefs about abortion and in experience, very few people really take that opportunity. But in this case, quite a few, almost a quarter of our, our 900 respondents did want to tell us more about their attitudes about abortion. And I won't go, uh, give away too many of the punchlines because this is an ongoing analysis with Maddie Green from the nursing school and Dan Pelliser from our own residency program. But I will show you a couple of quotes that I think represent this idea that uh, physicians' attitudes about abortion are complex and multifaceted. So uh, the first person hits the nail on the head pretty succinctly and says, these are difficult questions with many gray areas. While this second quote really gets at the idea that uh, a person can have both favorable and unfavorable feelings about a given issue at the same time. So this person says, as a Catholic, I'm strongly opposed to abortion. As a medical provider, I feel that the patient should be aware of all options available to her, including abortion, and that the provider should not seek to sway the patient based on the provider's moral stance. Another area in which healthcare provider attitudes play an important role is in the care of patients with obesity. 
Many of you will recall uh, a couple of years ago, the department put together a number of committees to work on different aspects of this issue. The education committee was tasked with conducting a clinical needs assessment. And based on the results of that survey, there was a year long uh, series of educational talks and professional development activities that aimed at uh, improving healthcare providers interactions with patients with obesity. And so I'll touch on that as well as a few preliminary details about a current study that I'm involved with uh, about the experience of pregnant women uh, seeking care in our department. Uh, so starting with the needs assessment and the resulting education and professional development, you can see that we were able to move the needle in terms of healthcare providers' feelings of comfort addressing the topic of obesity. Uh, we moved in the right direction with feelings of success addressing obesity, although that uh, result was not significant statistically. And we did see a statistically significant increase in optimism that patients with obesity can change. As I mentioned, uh, I'm currently collaborating with Katie Antoni, Danielle Hurst, who's a medical student, and Corinne Boyles from the surgery department on this study of healthcare experiences of pregnant women with obesity. So we did uh, 30 semi-structured interviews with these patients who had recently delivered. And the pur purpose of this was to improve the quality of care for those women in our department. And Danielle, who conducted the interviews, asked women to talk about their experiences seeking care, their preferred terminology for discussing obesity with healthcare providers, and for some feedback on a proposed group prenatal program. This analysis is also ongoing, so I won't go too much into it, but I do want to point out a couple of quotes that get at this idea that uh, the attitudes of healthcare providers really uh, come back around and affect the experiences of women seeking care. So one woman said, my weight was, the part of, was part of the picture. It was the first thing that people saw and the first thing that people commented on. And half the time, it was the only thing that people commented on. A second participant said, it's unclear if this job is so hard and there's so much information that you can never share it with all women or some women don't want the information, or if there's a bias that because you're overweight, you don't take care of your health, so we aren't going to give you all of the information. Finally, uh, I've been fortunate to collaborate with Heidi Brown and her team on a series of studies uh, that explore, among other things, the impacts of attitudes on care seeking and provision of care for women with incontinence. Not surprisingly, this is a topic that is associated with some stigma and shame. And this discomfort uh, tends to lead to a lot of misperceptions and lack of information about incontinence and also results in poor communication between patients and their healthcare providers about incontinence. So several years back, Dr. Brown and her colleagues found that patients prefer the terms accidental bowel leakage and bowel control issues over the more commonly used fecal incontinence. And they recommended that using those terms with patients in the public could go a long way to reducing embarrassment and encouraging care seeking for incontinence. In a later study, we identified a number of barriers to care seeking for ABL, including shame and stigma again, but also normative thinking, which is this idea that as women age, they should just expect to experience incontinence and just live with it. We also surveyed some Wisconsin primary care providers to get their perspectives. And what we found is a great deal of mismatch between the way that healthcare providers and patients think about this subject. So nearly one in five of the providers we surveyed that patients will bring up the subject of incontinence if it's really bothering them, whereas other research would suggest that the patients definitely prefer the subject to be brought up by the healthcare provider. Providers said that they prefer to screen verbally for incontinence, while uh, patients have said that they prefer to use written screenings. Uh, we found that use of preferred terminology like ABL is pretty low in this population, but those people who do know and use those terms are more likely to screen for incontinence. 
And we also found a wide range of provider misperceptions about the prevalence of incontinence among their patient population, the risk factors for incontinence, and also the, abil uh, the availability of treatments for incontinence. So provider discomfort with the topic of incontinence doesn't escape the notice of patients. As part of this supplement to the previous article in the online outlet Euro Today, we interviewed a patient to get her perspective. And she said, no one would ask about incontinence, so it went undiagnosed. When I asked, people tended to just write it down in the chart and not speak to me about it or would run away from me. And I assumed there was no treatment. Many of you are probably familiar with Dr. Brown's intervention called Mind Over Matter, Healthy Bowels, Healthy Bladder. Uh, this intervention, which an RCT found to be effective in decreasing symptoms of incontinence, uh, really targeted a number of attitude factors. First of all, uh, it tried to impart the belief that uh, incontinence may be common, but it's not normal. Uh, it tried to uh, give women some knowledge about how changes to their diet and fluid intake and exercise could go away to reducing their symptoms. And it also targeted women's self-efficacy through goal setting about changing diet and fluid intake and exercise, and also by offering some advice for those women who are not to reduce their symptoms simply through diet and exercise. This is a forthcoming paper uh, that's going to be in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society and the dissemination of and implementation of the mom intervention. And we found once again that stigma is a barrier to adoption and maintenance of the intervention among the community agencies that we worked with. And alongside our community partners, we devised a few solutions to this issue. Uh, our partners suggest we uh, emphasize the issue of prevalence in our messaging so that women didn't feel like they were the only one that had this problem and they were going to show up and be the only one in the workshop. Uh, they suggested that we advertise to emphasize prevention so that enrolling in a workshop about incontinence didn't necessarily out someone, so to speak, uh, as, as a person who is suffering from incontinence. And for similar reasons, they uh, suggested that we use discretion in our signage, our advertising, and even the logo that we use on uh, workshop materials. So I hope that these several examples have demonstrated that understanding attitudes and their impacts on behavior is important, and also that attitudes and behaviors can change. So examples of this are all around us in the current pandemic. I think uh, the common wisdom surrounding face masks has really shifted in recent weeks and months. Uh, a few months ago, it would have been unheard of to see a scene like this in the United States, whereas uh, now we know that people's attitudes about wearing masks in public to protect one another from the spread of COVID-19 have really been changing. And uh, I would propose that a major driver of that change has been better information and improved communication from our public health leaders. And if we can do it in the context of COVID-19, we can do it in other contexts. So I will end there. And of course, I've only scratched the surface of this topic. But again, I want to plant the seed that I would be very happy to discuss these concepts further with any of you. And uh, if there are any questions or feedback, I'm happy to take them now. So thanks a lot. Great. Thank you so much. Um, anyone with any questions? We'll give it a minute here. Hi, Nicholas. It's Ellen Hartenbach. Um, I just want to jump out there and say that was a great presentation. Um, I don't think, ha think I have anything smart to say other than I think people's health beliefs is one of the most important things for all of us who provide care to understand. And I've been fascinated by it for my entire, uh, I guess, 30 plus year career. So um, just thanks for um, the presentation, the general overview, and then for being a, a specific part of various groups in our department, because I think it will improve all of the um, research and care 
um, that we provide if we understand this more. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, I agree. I'm an academic way, but uh, being here in this department and being able to uh, look at these issues as they intersect with different issues in women's health care gives it a lot of meaning and it's been uh, a great experience to be working in this department. So I hope that I have opportunities to collaborate with more of you. Yeah, this is, um, oh, go ahead, Deb. Nicholas, really great presentation. Deb, I think we're losing you, um, yeah, and your connection might be bad. Uh, maybe you could try typing your comment in the chat box. No. <laughs> Do again now, Deb. So maybe uh, it will work. To... Yeah, it's been a bad video week for us. But can you hear me now? I can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so you know, yeah. I, there's there's a lot of health behavior theories out there. Um, and I'm kind of on, I, you know, because you really pay attention to this, I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts about the different models, where the models you use fit in. And kind of where what I had thought was sort of dominant in healthcare, which was the trans theoretical model, is now, and kind of how do you how do you think about where to go when when you do your work? Uh, I think that a lot of these models have overlapping components, and really they're just using different words to describe similar concepts. Um, some of them bring in, say, more outside factors or more social and environmental factors than others. Um, I guess I find theory of planned behavior particularly to just be sort of simple and, you know, it acknowledges that there are a lot of other things that are uh, going to affect people's ability to actually accomplish some health behavior, but as it pertains to just the study of attitudes and how those predict behavior, I just think it's kind of streamlined and, and useful in that way. Uh, the trans theoretical model I'm not as familiar with as those first two, although <clears throat> I, I've seen it a little bit in action. Um, I'd have to look at a particular uh, issue to see if I thought one model or another offered something uh, more than another, but but what I guess I tend to do is I tend to look at the health issue first and then uh, see what components of what's going on with that issue seem to pertain to things like attitudes or beliefs or knowledge, education, that sort of thing, and then kind of, uh, you know, backtrack to the model that it seems like it would be most useful. But actually, I guess so. that's a bit of a non-substantive answer, but uh, you know, I think for the most part, a lot of them are pretty overlapping and uh, they all have useful components. And, and in many cases, you know, it's hard to map every single component of a given model to whatever issue you're working on. And so even kind of taking them piecemeal can be helpful, I think. Super, thank you. Um, hi, Nicholas, this is Jenny. I had a related question actually. This was such a treat. It was so great to just see your expertise on display like this and to get some really helpful background that I learned from, and then also to see the array of projects. So thank you so much. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit in the theories that you use, the way in which structure plays in. So I'm thinking of racism and white supremacy. I'm thinking of gender inequality. I'm thinking of you know systemic power imbalances. And so how do some of these theories integrate and not address, but right? I mean, it's part of how people, it's part of people's attitudes and behaviors, right? And so how do how do these theories address those things? I'm very curious about that and how you how you deal with that in your own approaches. 
Yeah, well, I think, you know, her feelings about, about gender and other things like that do impact the way that people think, uh, you know, individually about particular issues. And then there's this separate aspect, which is structural racism, for example. Uh, so to get at the structural things, we really need different kinds of interventions. Uh, and so interventions that target attitudes are not really meant to be uh, used in isolation. We hope that people are working on structural factors that definitely uh, are barriers and facilitators to different uh, health outcomes. So uh, I think as it pertains to what, how people think about race or gender and how that ultimately impacts their evaluation of, of some issue like abortion, um, <clears throat> you know, those things can be tackled through looking at the attitude and behavior change models. But uh, I think, you know, we definitely just want to align with other people that are working on the structural factors and make sure that we're all on the same page and working towards the same things and, and kind of know that we're taking our little piece and, and seeing how we can uh, use interventions to modify certain attitudes that are modifiable. And that at the same time, we're making sure that, say, if, so, if we can convince somebody that, you know, they should uh, undertake a particular health behavior because it's best for them uh, and we make them feel like they have it within their power to do so, we need to make sure that we also provide the structure for them to, to do that. Otherwise, you know, we're going to get this boomerang effect where uh, people become convinced that actually this thing isn't possible for me, so I'm not even going to try. So I guess that's a, you know, kind of an answer to your question. I, I think the more umbrella answer is that just, you know, attitudes are not a panacea. There are all sorts of moving parts and we need to be, different people need to be focusing on all of them. Thanks. Hey, Nicholas, it's Heidi. Wonderful presentation. Um, I love your work and I love working with you and um, I hope lots of other folks in the department start thinking about ways in which you might be a good collaborator with them, but um, I also don't want to lose you so don't commit to too many other people. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, motivational interviewing and how that um, how that tech, I feel like that's a widely used technique in healthcare that sort of um, use it try like aims to change people through understanding their attitudes. Can you say anything smart about that? <laughs> I don't know that I have much smart to say. not that familiar. You know, I, I wouldn't call myself a practitioner of motivational interviewing or anything like that. Uh, I do recognize that it's a way to get in touch with what might be some of the underlying factors that have to do with attitudes um you know so we a couple years ago had a development session a professional development session with melody coles about um using motivational interviewing to try to uh, help women with obesity and so you know i don't think that women have obesity because that's just what they want or they, they don't want to engage in the kinds of behaviors that would uh, help them with that issue. But, you know, they have these underlying beliefs or, you know, lack of information or just various kinds of attitudes about obesity itself or the behaviors that they uh, would need to undertake to affect that issue. And so it's certainly a tool that can be used to gather information. I think the more we know about the factors that underlie people's attitudes, the more opportunities we have to modify those things to the extent that we can. So, you know, I'm all for motivational interviewing. It's something that I would certainly be interested in learning about, but, but I can't claim to be an expert. Nicholas, this is Laurel. I very much enjoyed your presentation and I'm feeling quietly very, very happy. You know, I 
did not fully appreciate how important the concept of um, program communication was until I met you. And I think what you brought to this department is a focus on our mission, mission and vision, which we clearly developed 10 years ago and still beautiful, our commitment to women's health on every front. And the work you're doing in terms of informing the community as well as UW, et cetera, is just very, very important. And so it's more, in my opinion, than, you know, helping specific investigators, which I'm grateful for, but it's a way to help us. And all of us are very, very busy. This COVID thing is driving everybody crazy. And even before that, we all work like dogs. A focused effort on how important it is to communicate our mission and vision, not just in words, but in all different forms of discovery. And I, I just have been so impressed with you and I continue to be impressed and we're very fortunate to have you in this department. So thank you. Appreciate that. And since coming here, I have thought of this department forward thinking in terms of communication and the importance of that. And so, uh, you know, I'm glad, as I'm sure everyone else is, that Jackie Askins has really taken that ball and run with it. She's doing an awesome job. So any other thoughts or questions for Nicholas? I'm hoping this is generating a tremendous amount of interest in his platform. Because between him and Jackie and several others in the department, you know, disseminating what this department is all about and how we can contribute as well as advancing discovery is just really important. So any other comments or thoughts? Laura Bazuda, you want to wrap it up? Yeah, uh, thank you so much today for speaking with us and, and presenting um, remotely. We really appreciated it and you got a bunch of uh, excellent accolades in the chat box on the side. I hope you can see those, but uh, thank you again for presenting and uh, everyone have a great day.